Awesome. All right, so hello everyone, good evening. Um, my name is Amy Chapkovich from the Lower Marion Conservancy. Um, and tonight I'm gonna present uh, a little talk on the pollinator pathway called Birds, Beads and Butterflies, How to Attract Desirable wild Wildlife and Join the Pollinator Pathway. Um, this program tonight is being presented um, in partnership with the um, Tikkun Adama Committee from Adith Israel. Um, and so, and also I wanna say thank you to St. Joe's who helps us host these Zoom meetings. Um, so thank you partners, thank you for bringing this to the Conservancy um, and uh, thank you for your interest in the pollinator pathway and really making Lower Marion and Narbertha a haven for wildlife. Um, so I will just introduce the, myself and the Conservancy and then I'm gonna hand it over um, to another guest speaker um, and then I'll do the full thing um, afterwards. So um, the, for those of you who are not familiar, the Lower Marion Conservancy is a membership supported nonprofit that works to protect the nature, history and clean water of Lower Marion and Narberth. Um, you guys, some of you may be familiar with our work and our planting projects, um, but this is actually a special year for us. It's our 25th anniversary. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work, um, a lot of webinars, pollinator pathway, uh, programs, but we've been also doing a lot of uh, planting projects in the community. You'll see some of the stuff we're helping out with um, in Sabine Park, which is where this photo is, and Narberth, um, as well as along the Kinwood Heritage Trail and in um, both Ardmore and Narberth as well. So we've got a lot of great projects going on um, and excited for our 25th year. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to Scott Badenkoff now, uh, who is going to talk a little bit about the intersection between um, pollinators and, and faith. So Scott, go ahead when you're ready. I stopped sharing my, I think I stopped sharing my screen. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. That's great. Um, thank you, Amy. Um, and good evening. Um, so post-retirement, I've been focusing on the twin existential problems facing humanity after I finished watching Game of Thrones, uh, global warming and loss of biodiversity. I'm a member of Temple Adith Israel on Old Lancaster Road, and our committee for Tikkun Olam of Repairing the World has spent this past quarantine year zooming about the environment. We changed the committee's name to Tikkun Adama, Repairing the Earth, and we are exploring how we can make our corner of the earth a better place for birds and bees. Before we hear Amy, I will take just a few minutes to tie in her talk with Judaism. And I have a slideshow. So uh, honey and honeybees were clearly known to the early Jews who, who looked forward to living in a land of milk and honey. However, milk and honey, chalav v'dvash, here probably referred to date honey made by people rather than by bees. Uh, but in the next chapter in the Torah, when Moses tells how the Lord guided Jacob and set him atop the highlands to feast on the yield of the earth and made him to suck honey from the crag, Devash Misela, most likely does refer to bee honey, probably made by wild honeybees, Apis mellifera, that we now think of as our honeybees, um, that records show were domesticated by the Egyptians. Honeybees you may know are, are not native to the United States, but many other species of bees and pollinators are. In fact, no matter whether you live in Center City, Philadelphia, or in leafy Lower Marion, a hundred or more wild bee species probably live around you. We, of course, are their caretakers. The Midrash warns us, do not corrupt or desolate my world, for if you do, there will be no one 
to repair it after you. Humans, bees, birds, and butterflies come together every spring in a complex and beautiful dance of pollination and nectar. Small native wildflowers often depend on small native bees for pollination, while others need big buzzy bumblebees and the bees depend on the flowers. As the days shorten, the eggs or larvae must be made safe for their winter the bees eggs or larvae uh, in the earth or in flower stalks. We are the gardeners. What should we plant? How can we help these critters survive the winter? Uh, let's listen to Amy Chapkovich. I think she has a few ideas about this. Thanks so much, Scott. It's really fun to do something like this where we get to sort of bring personal meaning and of faith to um, some really sort of applicable uh, quite literally get our hands in the dirt's topics. So, um, so in my talk, I'm gonna go through what the pollinator pathway is and really what a few of, or what the tenants are broken down um, so that you guys can learn how to be on the pollinator pathway, but really also how to transition your sort of transitional yard um, or even paved spaces into something that um, has more food and uh, for wildlife, but also creates biodiversity in your, in your backyard. So. Um, of course, starting with what is the pollinator pathway? So the pollinator pathway is an initiative uh, we launched with several community partners last October to establish a corridor of pollinator friendly uh, and stream friendly public and private properties uh, within our local watersheds. So Lower Marion and Narberth have about a dozen watersheds within our townships. Um, and of course, we're nestled within both the Schuylkill River watershed and the Delaware River watershed. So really thinking about this sort of regional approach to our backyards, because really whatever we do upstream affects everybody downstream. Um, and so we're also excited to say though that the, the pollinator pathway of Lower Mary Narberth is the first in PA. And we actually have over a hundred properties registered, a couple in New Jersey too. You can look at this map I have shared here online um, on the pollinator pathway for Lower Mary Narberth's website. Um, but we are the only uh, conservation group in the, in the region sort of monitoring this um, project right now. Hopefully some other local orgs will, will hop on as well. So um, why does this matter? So of course, wildlife habitat um, has been fragmented by development over the years. So when you know, uh, our area was being built up, there was a lot of homes, buildings, pavements, grocery stores put in, um, and of course, removing lots of native plants, trees um, to make that happen. Uh, and, and of course, those native trees and plants weren't replaced. They were replaced with sort of traditional landscape practices, um, which in America is a green lawn. Um, some of you may have seen at Mom's Organic Market, maybe they have a big sign that, you know, lawns are the number one irrigated crop in America. So um, really this is a huge, um, portion of our country that is plain, unbiodiverse grass lawn. Um, so we are trying to help people get native plants back in their spaces um, to really benefit these pollinators, which are under threat. Our bees are really needing the extra food and support um, and also support biodiversity. Now within that though, um, or, or looking forward, and I know this is why Adam Israel really wanted to create an environmental committee to um, make changes locally and within the congregation, um, but creating more wildlife habitat, bringing native plants and species um, to, back to Lower Marion and Narberth really is gonna help create resilience against climate change for both wildlife and humans. So um, there's really a now factor and a future factor. Um, and of course, this also gonna, is gonna generate clean air, clean drinking water, and, and beautiful landscapes. So I always think the florals of natives really enhance our beautiful green community. Um, now in this photo though, or in this slide, I have a photo of a flooded creek and you might be wondering, well, why is there a photo of a flooded creek? Aren't we talking about flowers today? Um, but really um, stormwater is a serious environmental problem in Lower Marion. Um, so this is a photo of just outside of Lower Marion. This is a photo of Cobbs Creek at Manoa Road, not too far from Karakung Drive or Penwin Elementary, if you've ever been that way. Um, and this is during sort of a normal summer rainstorm, maybe not normal, but this happens very frequently. 
um, where the water level is risen about 10 feet to almost the height of the, the bridge where Manoa Road crosses. Um, and so stormwater is really a threat to our infrastructure. This is cost taxpayer money every time um, this stormwater can pick up pavement, it ruins roads, it can take down light poles. Um, but it also can really be mitigated by native plants, by trees. And if we can really re-green our communities with things that aren't just plain grass, um, we can really help mitigate this issue too. And um, of course, we drink from our local streams and rivers. So this also helps us keep our clean water for drinking. All right, so back to the pollinator pathway itself. So there's four basic tenets for the, to join the pollinator pathway. Um, so I'm gonna go through each of these individually um, and I'll take I'll have time for questions at the end. Scott and I will answer um, any questions. So feel free to throw them in the chat uh, if you see anything come up along the way. Um, so the first one or the first tenet I'm gonna go into is plant native plants for habitat and stormwater management. That's the basic pollinator pathway start. Um, and why, again, we say both habitat and stormwater management is you see this diagram on the left, um, this natural environment. This is what our community or Pennsylvania would have looked like a thousand years ago, right? We have this natural, undeveloped environment where stormwater is able to soak into the ground. There's plenty of trees, uh, flowers, all sorts of things for wildlife. Um, and that's what it's sort of supposed to look like. But listen, I'm not going to say no one should live in a house. You know, I'm not telling you to go live in the forest. We tend to live in these urban or suburban environments where um, water really isn't able to soak into the ground. Um, and we've really almost eliminated um, our, our diversity of plants and trees and instead really paved and built over natural spaces that we, we need to keep for both stormwater management and the environment. So. Um, the way we shape our landscapes and how we take care of them really does affect um, both wildlife and stormwater. So native plants. Um, if you're not familiar with what a native plant is, it's basically just a plant that is indigenous to our region. So the mid-Atlantic is sort of generally how we categorize that. Um, some really extreme uh, native plant enthusiasts do regional town, almost down to the coordinate little ge geographic regions. Um, but sort of plants for the mid-Atlantic are totally fine for your backyard. Um, and the reason we encourage native plants is because, again, these plants have been here. They're adapted to our climate and conditions. They're drought tolerant, but they're also water tolerant because Pennsylvania is actually pretty rainy here. Uh, in the summer at least. Um, and they generally require less water, less fertilizers, and really don't need pesticides or anything. Um, so, and of course they support the biodiversity that we're aiming for in this pollinator pathway initiative um, more than non-native plants do. And I'll, and I'll talk why, actually maybe in the next slide, oh, two slides I'll talk more about why non-natives are not really of good service. So um, our native plants, are generally called host plants. Um, and this is because many insects like the monarch butterfly, for example, have evolved just to feed and lay larvae on very specific plants, maybe one, maybe a handful. Um, and those are host plants. They're hosting a certain type of insect. Um, and like I said, sort of the monarch butterfly is a classic example. Um, monarch butterflies can feed on several different plants. This one's feeding on a beautiful goldenrod we have here, um, but they only lay their larva on a milkweed plant. And milkweed um, is actually toxic. So their specific little caterpillars are resistant to the toxins in milkweed and they eat them and can handle them. So they need milkweed um, to be able to lay their eggs and for their lar young larva, their caterpillars to survive. Um, but native plants are foundational in the ecosystem or the food chain, if you want to think about it that way, because they provide, or by providing habitat for insects, sort of there's the ripple effect down the line. Um, birds come to feed on those insects, and later in the season, um, birds also benefit from the berries and seeds of those native plants. So it's not just planting for pollinators. Um, if you think back to the title of the talk, where birds, bees, butterflies, um, it's, we're really thinking about serving the whole ecosystem, the whole food chain. Um, and so 
As far as host plants go, if there's a specific type of insect or bird or something that you really love, um, you can actually plant your space for that. So um, I will email out a list of host plants or sort of common host plants um, for butterflies after this talk with the recording in a couple of days. Um, and you can look at this. This is just a screenshot of this long list. Um, but for example, you know, black cherry is host to the um, butterfly species, Eastern tiger swallowtail, red spotted purple butterflies, coral hair streak, striped hair streak, and spring azure um, butterflies. So you can maybe find something like if you love dogwoods, you know you can attract them, the spring azures. So um, you can really tailor your lawn or your backyard to uh, attract what you want, but you can also identify like oaks for example, or black cherries, uh, a plant that's going to serve a wide variety of species. Um, oaks are kind of generally viewed as one of the real saviors of the ecosystem because they serve all sorts of, something like up to 500 different species of wildlife from bugs to squirrels and birds um, can benefit from an oak tree. So um, really this will help, these lists will just help you decide what to plant. Um, so sort of back to flowers and nectar and non-native versus native flowers specifically. Um, so of course flowers provide nectar for insect and animals like bees. Um, and our native pollinators are adapted to native flowers, although we have many non-native um, pollinators around as well, which are considered sort of nativized. Um, but I have two photos here. So I have this photo of this little bumblebee on a echinacea, um, beautiful. You can see it's going for the nectar. The, um, the things are really wide and spread out, has plenty of space to access it. Um, and compared then with this uh, photo of a daffodil I took a few weeks ago. Um, now this is a, a daffodil cultivar. So it's designed to be beautiful, not functional. Um, but if you were an insect, where would you go? Would you know where to find the nectar in here? Um, so a lot of our non-natives or sort of genetically modified cultivars that are, are, are flowers that are beautiful, like believe me, I think this daffodil is gorgeous, um, really don't serve our pollinators. So that is why sort of choosing the original natives are really gonna serve um, your garden and your local pollinators. That of course is to say, if there's something you really love, I'm probably never gonna encourage someone to remove something they really love from their garden. Um, but again, just compare. If you're keeping a daffodil that is this beautiful, crazy, um, hard to access thing, do you also have food on your property that's easily accessible for our pollinators? So um, kind of looking at it from both ends. All right, so moving on to pollinator pathway principle number two. Uh, remove non-native invasive species over time and replace with native plants. So um, I, invasive species are rampant right now. We have tons in Lower Marion. Um, we do have, I would say, sort of like a dirty dozen or a top 10 or top 15 that you could get to know. Um, and I have this screenshot from a uh, PDF uh, booklet called Mistaken Identity which compares invasive plants that are really super common with their native lookalikes. Um, so you have like multiflora rose and rose, like these sort of things that you could be easily mistake for something else. Um, and this will really help you figure out what's actually in your yard and what you need to remove versus pulling something that might be actually beneficial. Um, so I know it can take a lot of time to get to know some plants. This is a great guide. Just Google um, mistaken identity PDF. It is widely available for free. It's really great. Um, and I personally use this one. Um, I'm also a really big fan of the iNaturalist app. Um, so this is a really awesome app that's come out a few years ago where you can take a photo of something and it will give you suggestions about what the app thinks the photo you've taken is. And so if you really don't know what something is, you can throw it in there and it's probably going to give you a top three good guesses and you can then use other photos to compare like, oh, is this what I think it is? Um, is this tree of heaven or is this a sumac? Um, and that will be really helpful. So those are just some tools for you. Um, but once you kind of know the basics, believe me, you won't forget them because you'll see them everywhere. 
Um, so once though you figure out your invases and maybe where you want to plant, um, you of course then get ready to start planting. So you can remove, there are a couple sort of methods for removing invasives and grass areas. Um, and they sort of each have their own pros and cons. So of course, first of all, you can hand pull sort of traditional gardening, weeding. You can pull out your existing plants, whether that's grass or invasive. And this is labor intensive, but it's fast. You pull it out on Saturday, you can plant on Sunday. Um, and, but there are, is some cons. So this is gonna disturb your soil around your area and it can awaken dormant seeds of both natives and non-natives. Um, but it uh, is, is fast and if you can get stuff in and maybe mulch over it, you might be okay. Um, another option, which I have a photo of here is smothering the area you plan to plant. So this is good, especially for a grass area. Um, you can just put cardboard, black plastic, maybe even a blue tarp would probably work um, and leave it for a period of time. Um, now, of course, this is not very attractive and your neighbors might be upset with you. Um, I think real diehards, like they do this over the full winter. You don't necessarily need to do that. Um, I think you could probably get away with a couple of weeks. Um, but so this method takes time, but truly it's gonna eliminate your sort of existing plant bed faster. Um, and it's gonna, because you're smothering and not disturbing the soil, you're gonna have less weed issues going forward, so lesser maintenance, um, and you're also gonna uh, contribute less to carbon loss. So in a way, if you're really um, minded or, or uh, really have your mind on your carbon footprint, this would sort of be the less um, disturbing way, way to go for that. All right, so once you have your area selected, um, you want to replant your empty spaces, uh, of course. So first of all, plant empty spaces within a garden, existing garden bed. Um, you really want your spaces to be dense. That will help reduce weeding, um, weeding maintenance in the future. Um, but it also helps the native plants um, outcompete invasives. So our invasives are really successful. That's what makes them so challenging. So you really want to not leave any soil opportunity for an invasive plant to get in there. Um, now, of course, also when you're doing this, when you're trying to figure out where to plant, what to plant, um, you know, ask yourself some questions like, how am I using my yard? Um, do I have a dog that loves to run around? Are my kids out of the, are, are they over 18? They're not at home anymore. Do I really need this space that they used to play shoot lacrosse in? Um, you know, look at can anything be replaced do i not love these non-native plants i have here and i'm ready to get rid of them anyway um and so you can also think of your um sort of lawn and paved areas as easy targets um and native plant expert doug talamy says to think of lawns as an area rug rather than a wall-to-wall -wall carpet so if there's any way you can sort of shrink your green lawn area and expand your beds or change it up um, in any way. Those are sort of easy, easy targets. Um, we have some big stormwater enthusiasts in the community who have removed paved surfaces in their backyard. Um, that's also gonna help. So literally reclaiming some nature space for your native plants, that's like even better. Um, so if you do have a dog or if your kids play soccer every day in the backyard, you know, think of places maybe though in your lawn that you could add trees or shrub with an existing lawn. So um, I love this photo from a uh, local uh, landscaping company, Refugia. And this is a great example of like, okay, the perimeter of this lawn is planted and it's planted densely. And this is high value stuff. We've got, we've got milkweed in here. We've got black eyed Susans. We've got things I can't even see, but that have high value for pollinators and stormwater absorption. Um, but they didn't sacrifice their whole lawn. The kids can still toss, softball, bas baseball outside, you know, it's not, the dog can run, it's not the end of the world that they took a few feet off of the edges of their lawn. So, you know, again, think of that uh, lawn as an area rug rather than wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. I'm sure we all could find a little bit of space in our backyards for, for more flowering plants. All right, so once you've sort of got your game plan going, um, like I said before, you wanna really plant your new gardens densely. So aim for no visible soil after a few years, gonna reduce your weeding, of course, 
um, and going to be easier to maintain in the long run so you don't have to fight invasives. Um, but also like keep your mind on layers and seasons. So um, gardens with high value to pollinators have layers of trees, shrubs, perennials, um, different sorts of grasses and sedges, um, all of these different things. It should be multi-layered um, in your landscape and that could take time to create. Um, but sort of the fun thing about this is that you can always edit. Um, and I also think you can really customize for yourself. So for example, if you love colors and, and you wanna see blooms in spring, summer, fall and fall, um, really look at plant lists that tell you when um, different flowers are blooming and you can make your garden a three or even four season garden um, with some of our, win you know, you could even have winter flowering with things like a witch hazel tree. Um, and plant for color, plant for what you like, right? You're gonna be more excited about your space if it has the colors and textures that you are looking for. So um, layers and seasons, that's what I think is, is a fun approach or a fun mindset to have when you approach. Um, you could also consider a rain garden. So um, if you have a downspout that like makes a muddy area in your backyard, or you have a wet spot in your yard that no one, no one plays in, for example, because it's too wet anyway, um, you could make this a rain garden. So a rain garden is a flower bed essentially that is just dug down into the ground, um, like usually about six inches, but it could be more, um, where rainwater or a wet area is sort of directed into this space. Um, and the water loving plants then are gonna absorb that stormwater really help hold the soil in better. I know um, my mom's house, she has some issues with runoff, um, taking soil with it. Uh, so you can hold soil better in place, prevent erosion, um, but also hold that rainwater uh, and, in place and prevent it from getting to our uh, already overwhelmed creeks. Um, this, however, I wanna say is not ideal for a vegetable garden, for example. You don't really wanna be directing um, some particles from your tarred roof uh, or any of those sort of chemicals that are can be in roofing materials into think something you're gonna eat. So this is really ideal more for just plants um, that can serve pollinators. Uh, so the Conservancy has a rain garden guide on our website and this um, can give you lots of information about how to plant specifically a rain garden um, instead of just a regular flower bed. All right, so also a fun little challenge, if you are on this call and you don't really have an area that you feel you could sacrifice, um, I encourage you to think out of the box because there are ways to add green to your paved spaces. So downspout planters are a really great way. You'll see this downtown in the city. Um, Philadelphia Water Department through their rain check program has a lot of these, the Conservancy, we've been cranking them out as well. Um, but basically a downspout planter is a, this is like a horse watering trough that we buy and we fill it with native plants. We direct a downspout to it and it's gonna absorb a lot of rain rainwater. I think it can hold something like 50 gallons during a storm, it's awesome. Um, and help filter that pollution out, um, but also add value for pollinators, birds, uh, insect shelter, all those sorts of things. And again, this is on, can be added to a paved surface. You don't have to sacrifice anything in your backyard or if you don't have the space to. Um, all right, so moving on to the third principle, avoid pesticides and synthetic fertilizers. So um, this is one of my like all time favorite things we've found at the Conservancy. Um, this is a little newspaper clip from 1892 uh, from a gardening column in the Germantown Telegraph about over fertilized lawns in Lower Marion. So this has been a problem for over 100 years in our area. Um, your lawn probably does not need as much fertilizer as you think. And in this little article, the uh, professional gardener says, people in Lower Marion apply manure to their lawns too often um, and really you don't need it at all if, um, and if you do, maybe even once every eight years. So if you are having your lawn fertilized every year by um, a company or you're doing it yourself, you probably really don't need it. Um, so cut some costs, cancel your services, and um, you can try some of these other methods. So of course, if you really think your lawn needs to be fertilized, the best thing to do is to leave your leaves. So in the fall, leave the leaves, let them decompose naturally, 
They also provide habitat for wildlife. Um, and if you really, uh, if you're not ready to, to, uh, to, to leave the leaves, you can rake them and store them for later. Um, there's different methods with that. Um, but your property really needs to be chemical free to be on the pollinator pathway. Um, and this is because synthetic chemicals do harm our waterways and aquatic life, uh, particularly fertilizers that we're talking about right now um, really uh, can affect the levels of the creek. There's also the threat of algal blooms where they create basically an overgrowth of algae in our local waterways, which smothers out aquatic wildlife. Um, and these can also favor invasive plants. So if you're fertilizing your lawn, for lesser celandine, which is a very aggressive spring. Um, they look like buttercups. You might've seen them. They are, come out very early in spring. Um, you might be fertilizing the wrong thing. So just be aware of what you're putting on your um, lawn because really um, native plants probably don't need or don't really need fertilizer since they're adapted to our local conditions. All right. so. The same goes for pesticides. Pesticides are very harmful to our environment, um, really particularly our watershed as well. So I cannot emphasize this enough, but in Southeastern Pennsylvania, we drink from surface water sources, creeks and rivers. So we are not getting nice tapped aquifer water, deep wells. Um, our region has too much um, pollution from our industrial history to really drink groundwater. So anything that is applied to a lawn or a roadway and gets into our rivers and streams, we're going to drink that later on or our friends down the line, like, you know, in Delaware or in Maryland, and they're pumping out of the Delaware River, other people are getting our chemicals. So um, really need to be careful. A lot of pesticides um, are labeled harmful to fish, pollinators, and aquatic wildlife. So um, pretty much any uh, like chemical you can buy at a big box store, you know, I'm not trying to say names here, but um, look them up on the EPA's website. Every chemical is required by law to have an EPA breakdown. And again, most of them are labeled as deadly for um, fish, aquatic birds, uh, pollinators, uh, aquatic wildlife of all sort. Um, and so this includes um, your average backyard mosquito, tick, and spotted lanternfly treatments. These are all professional pesticides, and they're going to kill mosquitoes and ticks, sure, um, but they're also going to kill pollinators that are attracted to the plants and uh, in a backyard. So I have a photo here of a European wasp um, on a tree that was treated for spotted lanternflies. And this is a, it's dying essentially. It's exhibiting the signs of death. And I know this is not a video, it's a photo, but um, really just because you're targeting one thing doesn't mean it's not gonna target other things. Um, pesticides really are not great for pollinators. Um, so if you really loathe mosquitoes, I encourage you to plant your backyard to help you attract desirable wildlife like dragonflies and damselflies that hunt mosquitoes, um, but also try chemical-free solutions. A lot of people have had great success, success with a simple oscillating fan or adding a ceiling fan to your porch um, to keep mosquitoes away. They can't track your scent. Mosquitoes use your scent and to find you. Um, and when there's wind blowing on you, they cannot really find you. So um, you might not even need chemicals in your backyard if you try, give, give some other methods a try. Um, and um, just be aware, if it says it's gonna kill one thing, it's probably gonna kill everything that's nearby it too. All right, so um, you might be wondering then, well, how am I you know, gonna keep my garden up? Maybe you're a long time chemical user, I get it. Um, but over time, when you're replacing native plants, again, if you're doing planting densely, really letting your plants fill in, there should be less and less space for invasives to come in. Um, if you've really struggled with the spotted lanternfly on your property, I'm gonna make a plug here for a talk I did, I've given a couple times now. Um, there's a webinar on the Conservancy's website where I talk about chemical free ways to address the spotted lanternfly problem. Um, feel free to check that out. But really we're trying to avoid chemical application. Um, 
So anyway, sort of back to care. Um, so when you're caring for your garden, um, we you'll find weeds. Um, and of course, if you're new to gardening, you may also though have some volunteers. So I have a photo here of milkweed um, volunteers and a volunteer is just a native plant that popped up on its own, okay? So you can see this is kind of a grassy, brushy area um, and this milkweed is popping up. So if you are not sure, again, use your resources, wait to identify a plant that could even be a few weeks before you pull it up. Um, so weed selectively, because you might be weeding out something that's good, um, even though it's not in the place you thought you planted it. So just be careful, weed selectively, um, because also some native plants can provide nectar and host pollinators that are adapted to those similar native plants. Um, but uh, you wanna just, you know, serve the pollinators, but replant over time as you can. Um, so also weeding, it's not always your best friend because I think we, I talked about this earlier, but you might pull up something that actually causes disturbance and allows something else to come in. So just be really aware when you're weeding, don't just pull everything out so you can have a perfectly, perfect even soil bed, um, really aim for more densely planted things than um, having to weed so often. Okay, so the final um, pollinator pathway tenant is leave winter habitat for pollinators. So um, first of all, this sort of just comes down to one thing, just let, let your backyard be. And this, the good thing is, is this is gonna save you a lot of work. You guess what? I give you guys permission to not do fall cleanup, okay? Um, so you wanna leave the dead stalks and stems uh, through winter and into spring, sometimes later than you think. Some people say you can remove things after the first, the last frost is done. I say leave it as late as you can push it um, because insects overwinter in the dead stalks and emerge in the spring. Um, and this goes for leaves too. Sometimes uh, there's a lot of butterflies and moths and such that are their larvae are laid in the leaf litter. Um, but once you sort of disturb your backyard, you cut the stalks off, um, you know, you've ruined that habitat. And I know a lot of people also um, like to mulch their lawns by, um, they'll do, uh, they'll um, mow it, mow their lawns and shred the leaves. That's also not ideal because you could be shredding uh, native egg larva for insects and stuff like that. So um, you can leave the stalks on until they are, so, till it's truly spring and these things have really emerged. Um, you can leave them in place or compost them. Um, if you truly cannot bear the sight of your stalks and stems over the winter, um, cut the stalks, uh, but, but leave them somewhere where they can still serve the wildlife. So if you have a space behind your garage or, you know, somewhere that's sort of tucked back away behind some trees, um, leave the stalks and stems, leave a brush pile for our native pollinators. They really need that winter habitat. You can do as much as you can in the summer, but if they don't make it to the next year, um, that food you've planted or the native plants you've planted that provide food really aren't doing a full circular service. Um, so I have here uh, bee balm, monarda, beautiful purple in the summertime. And this is what it looks like when it starts to die off, the seed pods. Um, I think it still smells beautiful and everything uh, into the spring or over the winter. So, you know, it might not be super attractive, but you can leave it be. All right, so where might you find these native plants? So of course, unfortunately, our big box stores sell few native plants and they often treat their plants with pesticides. So uh, particularly with monarch butterfly, if you are buying um, milkweed at a big box store, it's going to have a, a poison, which is so counterintuitive, uh, but it's gonna have something that actually can really harm uh, the caterpillar. So please don't buy natives at big box stores. Um, we have lots of local, um, nurseries such as Redbud Native Plant Nursery and Good Host Plants um, that, that can help you figure out what you, or help you get started on your native plant selection. Um, but there's also plenty of online retailers and uh, places that can ship you some plugs. So at the Conservancy, we get a lot of plant plugs mailed to us. They arrive fine in the mail. Um, and you can usually leave them in their trays for a while. So let's say you get them on a Monday, but you were planting, planning to plant, plant the next Saturday and then it pours that Saturday so you have to extend it another week. Usually if you uh, water your plant plugs and just keep an eye on them, 
they're going to be fine to leave for a while. So you can get what you need to get. And if you can't get them in the ground immediately, they're going to be okay if you just keep them watered. So um, I think something that's nice about natives is they're not, they're not so sensitive. They are hardier than some ornamental plants. Um, so after this talk, if you're still craving more resources, I'm sure that you guys are looking for plant lists, um, shade, sun, wetness advice, uh, hillside, um, all those sorts of different components of, that come into play with gardening. Um, the Conservancy has a ton of resources on our website. So big arrow here on this slide, www.lmconservancy.org. We've got our do-it-yourself rain garden guide. We have links to planting resources with plant lists, books, magazine articles, all that stuff. The pollinator pathway sign up link is there. Purchasing a sign link is there as well. Um, and we have so many great webinars that we've done in, during this, um, the pandemic times. We have webinars on rain gardens, planting for pollinators, managing the spotted lanternfly with alchemicals um, and beyond. We also have historic lectures, all different sorts of stuff. Um, but lots of good stuff on our website uh, for that. Um, so again, just a review of the pollinator pathway principles. If you want to sign up for the pollinator pathway, you'll want to plant native plants for, habit for wildlife habitat and stormwater management. You'll want to remove non-native species, uh, invasive species over time. I'm talking mostly plants here, but of course, we want to be addressing the spotted lanternfly, for example, in, in healthy ways. Um, avoid using pesticides and th synthetic fertilizers and, um, and let it be, leave the winter habitat for uh, pollinators. Um, and like I said, you can get, if you want to register your property, you can um, get a sign on our website. You don't need to get a sign. Um, you can also just put your address in the um, Google form and it'll show up on the map. Now, I do want to say, too, if you're not comfortable with having your address on there, there is an option to register your property but obscure your address. So feel free to do that as well. Um, no need to make it public. Um, but again, for, to join the pollinator pathway, no gardening experience required. Um, you can start small, edit as you go, um, and, and really have fun with it. If you love purples, if you love reds, you know, you can make that happen in your space. Um, and if you have questions, feel free to contact us. Um, again, I'm Amy from the Conservancy. You can email me at amy at lmconservancy.org. Um, but Tom Clark, who's our conservation coordinator, does a lot of uh, advice on native planting and um, stormwater management on your property and oversees our, our grant areas where you might be able to get free plants and that sort of thing, or a downspout planner. Um, so you can contact him at tom at lmconservancy.org. So um, I have time for questions and I'm sure Scott does as well. So if there's anything that is uh, on your mind, um, we can answer it. So Scott, there's one question in the chat that if I wanna mix in clover when I overseed my lawn, what's the best kind of clover to use here? Do you have a specific answer for that one, Scott? I don't have a specific answer for that. Um, I've bought um, a wildflower mix, for instance, from Ernst Seeds. Um, e R N S T, um, and um, they're kind of expensive, but very high quality, and they could probably answer that question for you. I I did just um, look on a website, um, and um, AmericanMeadows.com, and they suggested yellow clover or white clover are both fine. Okay, great. And I think Mount Cuba sells their own blend. Um, so you can really just check out online. Some of our online resources might have information about clover specifically, but clover is a great thing to overseed your lawn with. So awesome thinking there. Um, Kat asked if there are any plant nurseries that specialize in native plants. So our local favorites are definitely Redbud Native Plant Nursery and Good Host Plants, um, specializing in only natives. Like I said, um, those big box stores, they might, they sell invasives or non-natives as well. So you just have to be really careful uh, if you're going to go to a big box store. Um, all right. I bought some plants from Bloombox. They actually yes. deliver, but you have to be a little careful because they sell hybrids, you know, okay. which yeah. aren't terrible, but I want to read the fine print and make sure that you know what you're getting. 
do you want to say a little more about why hybrids are something to be cautious sure. of? Sure. Yeah. So um, native plants sometimes, you know, are great for the bees, but aren't very showy. And if you want something a little showier, um, <clears throat> uh, people are constantly, you know, trying to breed flowers, native, basically native plants that are showier. And, and sometimes, like the daffodil that Amy showed you, um, they just don't work well for bees. But, um, but uh, that's not always the case. You know, many hybrids are, um, it, so basically you, you wanna get a hybrid that's not too um, specialized so that it can no longer be used. But uh, many hybrids are fine. Yeah. Great. So just want to show, throw up this slide again of sort of the difference. Like if you're getting something that's more aesthetically pleasing, might not be as accessible for a pollinator to get to. So we've got the echinacea, which is like, come take this nectar versus a very showy cultivated daffodil. That's probably a little harder to dig through the folds there. Um, so great question there. Um, Tony, hi, Tony. Uh, Tony asks, what are a couple of good native plants for a perennial border? Um, I would say it depends on what you want throughout the season. So I love like early spring stuff, like like uh, flocks and stuff like that, but that might not be what you're looking for in, in a certain season. So, um, you know, Scott, I don't know if you want to chime in at all. Yeah, so, <laughs> well, I, there's, so you can think of, there's lots of tall plants, you know, like the echinacea and, and the cardinal flower. And then there's even taller ones like Joe Pieweed and so forth. And then there's like, um, you know, much lower ones like the flocks tends to be, well, it comes both in high and, you know, creeping flocks is a, a great one for, for um, spilling over walls and things like that. Um, and uh, yeah, so, and if you're interested in finding, um, you know, a contractor, um, a landscaper that does this kind of work, I would recommend um, going on to like the Lower Marion uh, community website and you can post a, qu a question there and get lots of, of feedback. Uh, I'm, I'm Facebook page, the Lower Marion community Facebook page. Yes. Um, so I know someone else did ask that, like, does the Conservancy recommend places? We don't recommend anything or anyone specific, but there are a lot of people in our community who do native pesticide-free gardening um, and or also design and sort of um, to get you to that point. And then you can do the planting and maintenance on your own or the full service. So Lower Marion Community Network Facebook page, great place to ask around um, for that. Or if anyone in the chat wants to throw some names in, feel free. Um, but yeah, so Tony, I think it depends on wh what you want. Yeah, do you have a, do you want to plant several layers? What height do you want? Um, all those sort of different things. So uh, the next qu next question is, what do I do about lanternflies? So here's my, here's my fast and quick advice. Um, the biggest, best way to prevent lanternflies is during the winter time. So just go out in your property, scrape as many egg masses as you can find into an alcohol solution or pop them individually if you want to do that um, and help getting rid of them before they are um, exit the egg mass is the, is the best way. Um, also wanna make sure that you're getting rid of your tree of heaven, those sort of things. And once it, they're in full out effect, um, we find that doing uh, a trap, a tree trap is probably one, one of the safest non-chemical ways to address them. But again, I have a whole talk that gives you about 10 different options of how to manage the spot of lanternflies chemical free and make the best decision for your property um, because they, they're definitely here, right? Um, but we don't feel at the conservancy that people should spray them. Um, and it's, it's worth remembering that Lantern flies are not going to kill most native trees. Yes, but most most native trees, um, the lantern flies aren't particularly interested in. You know, they're not native, and they go for some particularly not native trees. But um, you know, they can be harmful on grapevines, which are probably not native. Also, but. 
Yes. Yeah. So that's very true. They're really not. I think there has been some talk in the community that spotted landerflies are killing trees. They're really not killing native trees. That that damage that you see, that black sooty mold, the the honeydew. I think it, sometimes it looks worse than it is. Um, but they're more likely to kill the tree of heaven, the ailanthus altissima, that is also invasive, um, and of course our grapevines, unfortunately for the PA wine industry, but. Um, generally not backyard stuff. Um, so someone asked for the, um, the clover question suggested maybe using natural native violets or a native legume for nitrogen fixing. Great suggestion. Um, so what else? Okay, Kat also asked about um, more about the lantern flies. Haven't noticed any out. Are they about to emerge? I have heard some first reports that they're starting to emerge. So they're going to be in that little tiny black nymph phase. Um, if you I scraped some spotted lanternfly egg masses today while I was out in the creek with students. So if you see some egg masses, still scrape them now. Um, but they are about to emerge. You'll see the little black end stars hopping around. Um, try to get as many as you can. <laughs> yeah, we spray them with soap. <laughs> Well, so at the Conservancy, we don't recommend that just because of the effects for the watershed, but um, you can dunk them in soap and you can blowtorch them, you can vacuum them. Some people do. There are a lot of different methods. Um, uh, all right. Okay. So, yep. Someone else saw their first spot on Lanternfly Nymph today, post today. Definitely. Um, yeah, so it, it's taken me a while to get to come to terms with a, allowing violets to just grow in the lawn. But after a few years of, you know, con trying to convince myself, I've finally gotten used to it. And now I think they're pretty and enjoy them. Yeah, yeah, I think they're pretty too. I like them. Um, so everyone else is just saying thanks for the recommendations and ideas. Um, Amy saying you felt overwhelmed because she felt like she had to do it all at once, but now do you have a more manageable plan of action? That's great. Thank you. Like that's what I wanted to do tonight is just sort of give you some an outline of structure to figure out like, okay, I can go in and I can do this uh, six by five area and get some natives in there. And it, it, things take time. You know, Rome was not built in a day. Your backyard does not have to be this perfect haven by June 1st, um, starting tomorrow. Um, and, and it can be fun for you. If you love colors, if you love trees, you know, do do what you um, want in your space. So um, yeah, so thank you everyone. There's no more questions that I see at the moment, um, but yeah, I'm excited for Adith Israel's property to make some transitions um, back to something more natural and that really serves um, the community, I think aesthetically like is visually pleasing, but also serves the pollinators. So I'm really excited for you guys. Thank you so much for having me talk tonight. And thank you, Scott, for um, being my partner here. Oh, thank you so much, Amy. Thank um, you all. This, this is terrific. fabulous. Amy and Kat and Scott, thank you all. You're um, so welcome. We're like really excited for added for this partnership and um, just for the connection, but also just what I said to change 